Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the WGL EU week four of season two for 2015 and 2016. Two games already behind us, actually. It's been a fairly quick second match, of course. Uh, Kasna crew. That's not, uh, in terms of analysis, we probably didn't have a heck of a lot to say there. So it's very, very solid play from a team that we really only expect that from by now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they've had the cleanest season out of any team so far at the beginning, at least yeah. two five zeros and a couple of five threes. I mean, you can't really ask for for more at the beginning of of what's been typically a weaker part of their season in in previous ones. So, good start here for Kazza Crew. I mean, out of range, obviously, have a lot of work to do in every single situation. You know, we had some good tactics um, there. We had some good firefights there. Kazza was just a step ahead every single time around. Obviously, we're looking forward to their game next week when we play against Tornado. That could be. A truly fantastic match. And the first real time we get to see uh, um, Cancer Crew tested as Tornado have played, what, Synergy before? They got tested a little bit there, played yeah. Oops. You know, they've had some harder matches. And Tornado rocks now that we're on the topic of them, of because of course, in this next map. Um, some interesting and rather varied results from this team that you, multiple times, that we've all sort of said look like a, a very much a, an all-star team, a very, a very strong team individually. These mm -hmm. players are all quite good and renowned quite strongly in their own circles. But, you know, the reality is, is that sometimes we still, even good players like that can still, you know, have some difficulties. If you go back over Tornado Rocks, uh, some of their results as well. I mean, Oops was a pretty uh, five straight one. one there. So 5-2, I think five it might one. have been. 5-1? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, Tornado then, I think they, against Synergy, of course, they were tested, went to the tiebreaker on yeah. that one. Cliff was where, and that was just like, a, that was a particular match was just like a lot of weird stuff head-to-head -head fighting and we we're just seeing like what do you why are tornado playing like this it didn't seem like they were deliberately doing anything weird it's just that they didn't really have time for these preparing yeah, yeah i guess so and they just said well we are better we think we're better we're gonna go no, for it's it. just i think they played too much in a row i think they played wednesday and thursday in that super week and i was talking to the team captain yeah. team manager shifa and he said like yeah we always need that one 24 hour period which is obviously is not possible when you're playing 12 matches in one week. Sure. Because one team's going to play twice in a row. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's reality. It always happens. So, I mean, Tornado Rocks now, I mean, it was a 5-1, a 5-4, and then a 5-2 for them. So, it's still a pretty clean sheet, really, if you look at it. That one tiebreaker has left them, uh, honestly, only with eight, eight points, points so yeah. far instead of nine. Like, we will see, uh, we saw Kasner before, obviously, the win. So, you know, it, it slows you up a bit, of course, only getting two points from match instead of all three. But ding. A team that we have seen as being potential giant killers. They, you know, they had some interesting results last season. The last time Ding played against Tornado Rocks was in the first week of season one. That's going back a long time, a long time, like six months plus. So, um, you know, it's it's hard to sort of go on recent results as well. Format has changed, but Ding this season haven't really looked that good either. It's been a bit average from them as a team that we thought we hyped up in, in season one as a team that was very strong in go for what's as an example who had gone up against your your Virtus Pros or Wombats and Tanks as they're now known had gone up against those Tornado Roxas and Kaznas and, and actually put up decent performances against them off or outside of the WGL Gold Series Coming into the season, some good results there as well. Tested Synergy, uh, beat Virtus Pro, uh, tested Tornado Rocks. It was a tiebreaker in that first match week. Yep. So they put up these really close teams against the, the games the against teams. the top teams, and yep. then it started getting shrekt by uh, teams like your Penters and stuff like that as well, who were that mid table. So we're never really able to distinguish themselves and actually run ahead of their pack. It seemed to me like what Ding did was basically train against those top teams, so they got good at beating them. And then a lower team would come along with tactics they've never seen before, throwing things up in the air which they've never seen, and then they just got beaten. So I think looking at Ding this season, though, they're a lot more consistent. They made some changes to their roster, which m makes it more solid, which has made it a little bit more solid. You know, they got uh, International in there, who's a very experienced player in the WGL, been around for a long time since Red Gra. Um, back in like 2012-13. So he's, he's been a very experienced player. We've got Rulzek, who's also been pretty good this season. Um, yeah, and you're right. I mean, they, they okay, they lost against KB, but they, they played against Penta, managed to pick up a, wing la yep. a win last week. Um, yeah, so they are a strong team right now, and they will test Tornado in this match, I think. Well, I mean, uh, the first map uh, when we do get to it is going to be Ghost Town. Now, we've just got a couple of players that we're trying to get into uh, into the lineup. Also, to point out as well, Mercar, of course, coming across from... Uh, was he always in Ding or did he come from ASAP? I feel like he was in the ASAP. He was always lineup. in Ding. Always in Ding, okay. Um, I mean, Ding, on that note, not hugely changed. I mean, like, obviously, Meritorious featuring in that lineup as well still. Uh, your Hulknik's there, Diplomat. Um, yeah, so not they didn't really go through too many big changes. You did highlight Rulzik as a player who's been quite big this season as well, who's, who's had some really, really good games. I mean, but again, we've always talked about Rox as a super team here. They've got these good individuals. 
if if tornado rocks are tested why or how would that sort of happen? Will it be um, Ding being able to go go head to head with them in the one v ones or mm. the, the battles, or tactically, or Tornado Rocks maybe get a bit lazy or lax? Where do you think the real uh, points of contention are going to be between these two teams? Well, I think with them sixty eight, it's more about skill these days. Um, you know, and the tank picks. You know, being able to pick tanks that can go one versus one against the other team's tanks is very important. So I think, first of all, I mean, just as a base, you need to have players who can perform against the level of Tornado Rocks' players. So, you know, like top, top amazing players who don't miss anything, don't make any mistakes in this high-pressure situation. That's going to be the most important thing, I think. And then from there, it just comes about preparation. You know, how, how quickly do you react, react? And of course, that's, you know, the forte of, of Tornado Rocks. They're so fast to react around the map. They always push in. Immediately, they're always making the right decision. They're always going into these positions, which you don't really expect them to be. So they're extremely fast to react. They might not be the best ta in tactically, but World of Tanks, since, since for a very long time, has been about a reaction game as well as uh, you know an information game. So I think that's how you're going to counter. I, I think, of course, you know you can have these cheesy strategies, which you know catch Tornado Rocks off guard. They haven't trained against it. You know They're a very high intense training team which you can win, but you know, if you want to win against a team consistently, you need to be as good as them at what they do themselves. And to, uh, one thing about being such a high intensity training team is that sometimes you can get locked into this this mentality of just being only prepared for what you see in these trainings. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for Tornado Rocks as well as a team that has connections both in Europe and of course in the Russian side of things as well with a lot of those CIS teams and Russian teams who, I mean, we, we actually saw a lot of them come over from Hellraisers like was mentioned earlier on. So they're they're known in that scene as well and they can sort of practice against teams from the, from the Russian league. So, I mean, we saw this, uh, we talked about, I think Virtus Pro in a similar way back back when they were named as such is that they spent a lot of time screaming against Russian teams and then when it came to playing against the EU teams which was actually quite a distinctively different style they find that they actually had to backtrack a little bit and, and actually adjust to what we're seeing from European teams not necessarily that it was a stronger or better play style but different and you know when we're seeing the lineups always being catered to a certain style of play that worked against maybe the Russian style and then we're seeing uh, the Europeans go for something a little bit different as well uh, it was quite surprising now though I think uh, with the format being the way it is we're seeing a less of a divide between those two regions yep. I think a lot of European teams also playing up against uh, teams from the Russian server as well yeah um, we're just seeing now uh, to rocks uh, missing a player they as are well so. a player. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so yeah. waiting for them to uh, get this stuff done. But before we jump into this one as well, uh, we'll throw it over to Melly because uh, we do want to know, of course, that the votes are open. We didn't mention this at the start of the map as well. Sometimes we only come to it at four four rounds in when the votes are already closed here. So, Melly, I mean, uh, votes are open. I mean, have people sort of been putting their p opinions in yet? Well, they're still baffled from the 5 nil ending from the match before, but... Um Quite a few people are already voting for this third or last matchup of the night. Currently, it's 72% for Tornado Rocks, which is solid. It started out with over 80% drop down very fast. So um, let's see if it uh, develops further. Well, if it shifts more towards Dings. Sorry, because Ding have been building up their fan base recently. And um, well, People, if you haven't voted yet, head over to facebook.com slash WGLU and get involved. It's your chance of winning bonus codes. We are giving away three per match. So this is the last time you can grab yourself a nice bonus code. So I very well recommend to, to get involved. Another way of uh, getting involved, of course, is Twitter. If you don't use Facebook, you can use our hashtag WGLU to tell us what's on your mind. How do you think this match will go? Just tweet us. We love reading from you and it keeps me busy. Typing away, of course, so while the matches are going. Or oh, sometimes you see, if Melly doesn't have enough to do, she's sneaking over here like, what's going <laughs> on with these games? Who's who's doing what there as well? So, I mean, let's uh, let's backtrack a little bit over at Ding's record so far. We said that maybe they're not looking super strong, but the reality is, is that their first game was a victory over Rusty Roster. Pretty convincing, I think. Obviously, uh, against KB, they went down, but before that, uh, or after that, sorry, they managed to get a win against Out of Range. So they, so far, Ding have dealt with the rookies as well. I yep. mean, KB, Rusty Roster, and Out of Range. All new teams to the to the the league this season so now it's a big jump to a team that is pretty familiar with uh, the WGLEU and have been here for a while and obviously were representatives at our season finals for season one and of course the winners of the Continental Rumble so this is a very uh, very well adjusted team uh, and that's where Dean might find themselves tested a little bit more 
Losing uh, that game to KB, maybe some uncertainty uh, surrounding them. But, of course, as you said, KB are, are probably the, the strongest of these rookies coming into the mix here as well. And, you know, maybe not reading too much into the results that uh, you're getting against a team like that. Um, waiting for Vorsik here to uh, join up. Just uh, some of the sort of wire stuff as well. So we'll, uh, we'll still wait on that one for a moment here. I mean, Ghost Town is going to be uh, the start for us here. It looks like it's going to be... The defending side to start with for Ding here. Yeah, we're going to be getting uh, Ghost Town first, and then Miravanka, Ruenberg, Mines, and today's tiebreak is Himmelsdorf. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, we're going to get uh, basically a, an open map, followed by no, a city map, followed by an open map, and then a city map, followed by an open map. Because, uh, yeah, Ghost Town, Miravanka, Ruenberg, Mines, and then Himmelsdorf. So that's interesting. Always gives us a little bit of variation. Hashtag I hate Himmelsdorf, anyway. Uh, Ruenberg. But, I mean, yeah, so a mixture of everything. Obviously, it's not a T-57 artillery. Don't know why that's not fixed. And um, that's just going to be a T-57 heavy tank and the IS-4, of course. So, yeah, interesting first lineup here from both teams. Pretty heavy. And um, it looks like Dido is going to be playing that T-110E4. The shot caller for Tornado Rocks. It's not out of range, by the way. It's Ding. We've already seen out of range today. Obviously getting wrecked by Kansas Crew early on. <laughs> Can Carmen just tweeted that he's got a lot to think about. That's good. That's true. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's constructive, you know. I think our range is in the WGL for the long run. So, I mean, they need to be treating this first season as a kind of uh, introduction, we could say. You know, looking for maybe a top six, top eight result. And then, uh, you know, go into the next season with... Uh, a lot more experience and probably uh, a better result, you know, looking for a, a land finish. So let's discuss the T110E4 now, obviously being brought in here uh, from what it looks like for Tornado Rocks. Dido, of course, playing that one. <clears throat> on this map, we've seen, uh, I mean, both that one and the Yagpanzer E100 played a fair bit. And it seems like, th th honestly, we're not seeing a ton from these uh, sort of tanks uh, so far. I think last time we actually saw a 110E4 being used, it was up towards that middle cap and just watching it from uh, the north and northwestern side. I mean... When you have so much room to move around a map like this, of course, on the periphery, you can you can move those lighter tanks around. You know, is it is it a threat to that 110 forward? Is it something you sort of need to be bearing in mind, of course? And what's the best spot to be sort of putting that tank? Have we seen that already? Or do you perhaps think that there are better ways that teams could be using that lumbering tank destroyer? Well, I mean, it's a good hold-down tank. That's a very important factor. Uh, it's good for holding positions. I mean, we're seeing Ghost Town being a kind of positional map where you have, on the defensive side, some tanks in some positions to hold the corners to make sure the team can't push up, get control of the cap, get control of that middle area. And that's, you know, where the E100s, the T110E4s, the big hitters come into the equation. Um, and, you know, the T110 is a little bit more agile, a little bit more mobile, more compact than that E100. And, uh, you know, has a... A decent rough as well so yeah i think it's a i think it's a good pick i mean uh, i can bounce a lot more that's for sure and um that definitely comes into the equation uh, of course you know with these uh, first couple of volleys going always normally into the front of the tank unless you have the patience to wait until you get into the side which is not always possible you know that first one or two bounces can make all the difference we've already seen like what three or four one versus ones or two versus twos two versus ones today and um you know that's a real possibility on every map Especially this one as well, where teams are splitting themselves up so much. So it looks like Tornado Rocks having a little bit of issues with bringing that last player in. So what we'll do is actually go to a break while they get that sorted instead of sitting here and filling uh, for the entire time. So we'll be back hopefully very, very soon when Tornado have all their players ready to go. Don't go too far.
Welcome back, everybody. We are sorry for the brief delay in the start of this match, but we are happy to announce the Tornado Rocks have all of their players in the lobby and they're ready to roll. We obviously did delve very, very deep in towards discussions about this match before we even got to this point. So uh, hopefully we'll be jumping into game pretty much straight away. It does seem like the teams are ready to go. Again, for those who just joined us, uh, it's Tornado Rocks going up against Ding and Ollie. Um, I mean, you've seen the tank lineups. We've talked about it. I mean, 25 words or less. What's your impression? How is this one going to go? Well, on paper, it should go Tornado Rocks' way. Um, but looking at the previous results, Ding should at least be able to test them. All right, we saw the tank picks a little bit earlier on in the piece here. Double Conqueror for Tornado Rocks, plus a lot of fe 215 bs And we did highlight, of course, the T110E4, a Tier 10 American Tank Destroyer being taken here for Diodor as the caller. We can bring that one up again for you guys to see. Now, T57 is the T57 Heavy, not some secret artillery you've never heard of, although the, the uh, indicator might indicate otherwise. There is a, that is a T57, of course, in the game, so a bit of confusion there uh, with our system. Nonetheless, let's see now. Is, uh, it's a couple of E100s here for Ding, who do over see favor those heavier lineups two two one five b's 57 heavy of course let's see now as what is tornado rocks showing off their camo for the first time i've seen it at least and they're going to be pushing forward up into this middle part of the map pretty quickly in fact is the annihilator already fancying a bit of a fight against stoic and this is tornado rocks have looked to be an aggressive team in, in recent games we've seen from them a yeah, nice couple of shots stoic does get one on the side there against the annihilator but yeah this is uh tornado rocks getting some good initial um, pres presence over towards that middle area. I mean, they're putting all their tanks there. They've got so much HP to play around with, with the Conquerors and the FE215Bs. And they are just going to be sitting in the cap and saying, hey, ding, come as. Well, Diodor now going to be pushing around the corner. And of course, uh, the T110E4 does have that rotating turret. Not as well armored, as, of course, as the E3, but still can pack a punch. And here is Ding, of course. That's Diplomat, who just did take a little bit of a bashing from that tank. Now, it's going to be a very, very quick push, push towards the cap here. Ding have to stop this one, or Tornado Rocks can just push out. As soon as they see the overall match, they seem to want to go for it. Hulknik was a little bit caught out on his own here. Tornado Rocks didn't want to go for the cap anymore, and they wanted to push forward. They've taken a fair bit of damage. They're looking for Hulknik, but a couple of shots have not found their mark here, and they're sustaining a lot of damage themselves. They're receiving so much damage. I mean, two of their tanks are now one-shots, but uh, still, Ding aren't finding the mark. They aren't finding the tanks. Finally, they do, though. Forsen does go down but Rulzig already falling quite quickly in response and, and Tornado Rocks have the right tanks in the right places at least by the looks the Annihilator drops down Diplomat seems to be the target now as well and there's at least one in every two shots being missed here for Tornado Rocks and it's giving Ding an out back in towards his game they're down to four tanks Ding now at least dropping to four but they're going to bring that 57 Heavy of Meritorious in towards the fight he can burst down towards his Conqueror of Armageddon and he picks him up three tanks left for Tornado Rocks now and they're just doing so much damage towards FC Dynamo uh, what? I, I don't know. I really don't. I, don't. I don't get it, Ollie. They're sitting on the cap. They're looking okay. And they decided to push forward into Ding and just have a scrap of it. I mean, they were just trying to do that classic ghost town thing when you're trying to get the overmatches. You're getting an early advantage. But I mean, like they they missed a, a load of shells at the beginning, or just their focus fire wasn't on the point. And then when Ding actually found the E100, RU251, a few other tanks coming around the corner. You know, they really started to do some great damage against Tornado and uh, take them out. And that was a, a pretty sloppy first round from Tornado, I have to say. And you can see how slowly Diodor's turret turns as well. This is a really bad situation to be in, and it's a 110E4. And Stoic gets the finish, and Tornado rocks with a very disappointing start to things here. Giving Ding a win over there. I mean, yeah, sure, I get it, Oli, like going for this overmatch. But when you're already capping and having good progress for that and not having anything reset, and Ding not actually really... Ding didn't expose anything or they didn't give up any tanks on their own to sort of go for the reset. So it wasn't like they had an easy pick. No, I mean, I think, I think, I don't know. I think Tornado Rocks probably couldn't have capped that one out. I think that would have been sure. very, very hard of them to do that. You know, one RU251 shot every six seconds would have reset it. And then, you know, slowly but surely it would have been game over. But right. I mean, they're just, Tornado just pushing in. I mean, receiving so much damage. Focus Fire was a bit iffy. Some bounces, some Michelles for sure. Um, you know, hitting the top of the FE215B turret, you know, not doing any damage. And then you had the RU251, you had the the, uh, the E100 of, of International just pushing into the battle and just doing great damage. So yeah, for sure, there's one point there where Tornado Rocks were neck and neck against Ding, but that was just against that one group of tanks they were pushing. Without counting in International, who did 3.8k damage here, who was coming around the side. With an E100 as well. Very, very, very strong. I mean, Diodor did upwards of 4k damage. He wasn't the issue. The rest of his team was. I mean, I mean, between Vorsen and Armageddon, there's like 1400 damage on the table there as well. Mm. It's weird. Very, very weird play. Um, 
They play differently. There's no doubt about it. Well, Matter Rock's never really, honestly, like you said, that that strategy is similar to what we've seen before. But the way they did it and the timing of doing it as well just seemed absolutely bizarre to me. Mm. I don't know if it's overconfidence, lack of preparation, cockiness, or just an absolute brain fart that put him in that position. But you know, it's funny. This team always, <laughs> always makes us second guess them. And they are good. Don't get me wrong. But they're not the best. The fact that they can honestly turn around and embarrass rocks like that as well is should be a little bit concerning. And this is the same stuff we see for rocks often. They just want to go for this fight, and there's no assurance. Yeah, in I mean, they're, just go, they're going for the fights. We saw like on Brock or off against Synergy, Torne rocks with like five bat chats, just pushing up, yeah. being aggressive, super aggressive on on Cliff, always going for the fights and stuff. There's no brains behind Torne rocks right now. I mean, they're going for the overmatches because they got the better players. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know that's simply how it's going to work out for them. I think for the rest of the season or at least at this stage, until they start you know, losing one or two matches. But you now Ding has a lot of good players, good tactics. They know what to do, when, when to do it, and um, that could start punishing them for sure. It's another heavy lineup coming out here from Tornado Rocks, and well, to be fair, the same could be said of Ding here. They're going to go with the RU251 Stoic, actually still the last man standing at the end of that last game. So he was able to be... Um, he'd definitely be able to be a presence there as well. Now, whether Tornado Rocks want to go for a big fight, again, remains to be seen. I mean, so far, they're all filtering in towards the middle of the map, so you'd be forgiven for thinking that they might actually try and do that. But Ding, not going for anything of the sort. Moving out towards that eastern side of the map, and even putting a, a position of Stoic there as well, up quite a long way north with Hulknik, of course. As Oliver's pointed out, and as uh, Papa Pavian actually demonstrated to us at the inception of this map last season, this is an excellent, uh, that north little, north east corner is a great shot to, a great spot to put shots from. But here we go, Tornado Rocks again moving as a unit, flexing an object 140 around the side. Able to do a good amount of damage already to Meritorious, who probably will be overmatched on, and well, maybe Ding might be caught this time, but Tornado Rocks showing absolutely no imagination really with their strategy whatsoever. Super aggressive, and Mary definitely should have probably reversed around that corner and just kept himself safe considering he had so many shots going towards him. But still, I mean, okay, Tornado Rocks, they have the higher ground, but the Annihilator just going on on his own in that Object 140 is going to get killed. Higher ground not always an advantage as well when the FT215Bs have such hard heads. A few stray shots going in towards him and it's just going to bounce off harmlessly. Ricardo's take a little bit of damage there as well, but look at the responding fire. Positive getting absolutely smacked. Vorsig taking a bit of damage as well. Positive getting focused down super low, and Ding are winning this firefight in a big way. Oh, this is just huge damage. The focus fire is, is amazing from Ding. They're choosing a target, they're taking it down. I mean, Daido is keeping his team in the game with that T124. He's, he's really making the peaks at the right time, but he's also not playing particularly far forwards, which of course that American tank destroyer should do. Ruzik now can push forward and pick up positive, and FC Dynamo will be on his own now with the other FV215B to fall. And Tornado Rocks yet again go for just a, a very standard push out, and a team like Ding is better than that. They're better than this, and they've got to punish you. FC Dynamo burns down, and that is it. Again, Ding win by 6k hit points. You know, I, I feel like I'm being a bit hard on Tornado Rocks after some of these games. You know, Sometimes I wanted to say that was crap, <laughs> but uh, it's because we expect more from them. Yeah, I mean... This is the team that said they were the best team in the world. And to be fair, looking at that lineup, like, come on, they are technically the best team in the world. If we look at over towards the RU and CIS region, Herades has lost their initial match against NSS. Um, no, no, Navi lost against N no. Her Arcade lost and NSS. Arca Ar yeah. No, Arcade and um, Navi, they went up against each other, Hellra and they lost. Hellraisers against NSS, they lost. So those two have already lost their beginning matches. So uh, there's you know a real chance here for. Um, Tony Rocks to claim that title of Na'Vi, to claim that title of, of uh, Hellraisers and be the best team in the world. But right now, they're looking a bit shaky. Tell me about this style, Oliver. Like, I, I know you watch a lot more of the, the Russian league than I generally have the chance to. Is this, is this an RU style or is it just Tornado Rocks just putting brain on autopilot and just playing uh, whack-a-mole? That's not an RU style. I mean, typically the RU teams have been less aggressive than, than the rest of the regions. They're the ones who've always been playing like the, the kind of tactical game with the sniping and stuff. And, you know, the, the way they get beaten before is with the aggression. So, no, definitely not an RU style. This is, diff this is different from Tornado. Yeah, different is a very nice way of putting it, Oliver. Um, <laughs> Diplomat and Rulzik there getting 3K, hit, uh, 3K damage uh, between the two of them. So, Zephy215Bs there coming up trumps, I think. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, he came Duke... around the side. He was a bit slow to, to flank, but he, when he got it down, he, he could finish off the tanks that were already taken pretty low. And even Meritorious as well, who was the first target there, managed to eventually back around the corner. You did mention maybe he could have pulled back a little bit earlier on. Mm. Still got uh, 1,700 damage across the line here as well. Uh, the Annihilator on the Object 140 did 666 damage. Diodor and Armageddon did less than that. So, yeah. hello. <laughs> no, I don't know what's going on. I mean, we're going to be moving on to Moravanka now as well with just a second. And, uh, I mean, again, this time Rock's going for a little bit more of a more mobile lineup. I mean, we're seeing the 110E5s being picked up here as well. Tanks that we saw early on tonight for, from Penta, I think, be successful in aggressing towards the hillsides here on Moravanka and actually going in a situation where they looked like they were going to lose out, bounce a lot of shots, get up to the top of that hill and actually return damage uh, sort of tenfold. So... Mm. No, that was the other way around. That was uh, Strong Siemer who were the ones who were being with the T110s and uh, Penta were the ones with the... Uh, with the, yeah, they had the T110s going forwards, but then they had the bat, they were going against the STPs. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it was the other way around. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, in my opinion, that that loss was down to Strong Siemer just not being aggressive or not playing to the strength of the medium tank by flexing around the map. And we'll yep. have to see if one of these two teams make that same kind of mistake, not playing to the tank strengths. And of course, you know, with 768 just coming out, you're still trying to get into the groove of these tanks, even if you have played them in random battles or whatever. It's a whole different ball game when you're playing a more uh, competitive mode. I like this from Stoic, straight away pushing on towards the cap. And he honestly doesn't stand to lose too much, actually, by sitting up here right on the corner on the hill. So, pressure being applied already, and Tornado Rocks will have to respond to this. Now, Oliver, they have zero mid-control, and they have a very limited capacity to obtain said mid-control. So, how do they deal with Stoic here? Artillery. Yep. I do have well, one. The Armageddon's actually moving a little bit there in the M40, M43, so... Trying to find a different angle, and to be fair, the further left he goes, the easier the shot you'll have, um, less of a depression to deal with. And um, I guess that's one of the biggest problems with inaccurate artillery, is like, they often have... You'll often get the splash, but when you're shooting against something which is on a slope, like, you'll often end, end up shooting the top or the bottom of the slope, and you won't get any splash, or get very minimal amounts. So, Armageddon moving. Obviously, positive and Vorsic in those two T110s, the perfect tank for that position. Mary, Mary's got to be a bit careful. Does uh, receive a shot there on the top of that ob Object 140, but still, I mean, right now, Tornado is just keeping those T110s in case that last-ditch attempt does have to be made until the artillery can get in there. My only concern here is that Ding don't really have a great cover fire for Stoic if he does get pushed by these 110E5s around the corner. I mean, now you can see these movements of the double STB and the uh, Batchat around the map. So they're actually going to take that mid-control and be able to intervene if those T110E5s actually push onto the cap. And I think they will. I think it's reasonable to expect them to do that. International's there with the STB1, and that one shot missing means that Positive just goes for the reset here. He just comes forward. The rest of the 110E5s do as well. They force Stoic back, and they're actually probably happy enough with that, not having to do any damage. Still putting themselves in a fairly vulnerable spot, but now they're realizing that Ding didn't have any tanks actually there to fire at them like they may have expected because Ding are pushing them over the hill, over towards the right side. Yeah, and this is uh, not a lot of pressure here from Ding right now. Oh, good damage onto FC Dynamo. He gets set on fire, actually. Very unlucky for the Object 140. Dead. And he oh. doesn't quite fall. I think six or seven ticks happen. Stoic just easily takes care of him. And uh, yeah, I mean, first tier 10 tank off the game for Ding. Uh, well, Meritorious took a massive hit there from Artillery, if I'm not mistaken, and Diplomat getting tapped up as well. He's having to back right over the hill. A bit of a mistake from Ding there, actually, when they were starting to look a bit better. But Mercar and Hulknik, like you said, Oliver, use these mediums to their strengths and actually flex around the map a bit. They can threaten Diodor from this position, who only has one shell left. If very vulnerable. Ah, that shot and being missed there from that STB of Hulknik, really a crucial one. You really need to hit those. Diodor now can go up and join the rest of his team. So Ding, have to be careful now, because Tornado Rocks can quite easily push towards the north or right through the middle. You can see that... That 3090 of Stoic is, uh, oh sorry, uh, International is going to be threatened here. He has to give up that ground. Diodor was actually going to try and hunt down Meritorious, who's a one-shot here. So good decision by him, actually, knowing that he only had that one shell. He's going to be able to put it to good use here as well. Should be a fairly easy connection to make towards Meritorious. Um, he's saving that shot as well, making sure he can line it up just perfectly. He knows he's got very little to lose by that, but shot's coming in towards the back of him. He is punished for that one, big time. What the hell? I mean, Diodor doesn't make those kind of mistakes, okay? You want to hit that shell. You also want to stay alive and have reload on that bat chat. And he would have been in a great position just to flex up towards the north of the map and then get around to that middle area and make some shots against the back of Ding. So, yeah, I mean, bit of a mistake there. And the Nihilists get getting set on fire. And I have to say, Wrecked? Tornado Rocks are just Wrecked? not have any luck at all. I mean, of course, it's a, it's a characteristic of an American tank to be set on fire. I think like 25% chance or somewhere around there, 10 
15 to 25 percent so it does happen quite often but still i mean i have to feel a little bit sorry for tornado they're not exactly having the most lucky game in the world tornado rocks are down to four combat tanks and the annihilator is incredibly low so good use of these mediums going forward for ding will yield them positive results i'm almost certain of it lucy Kel takes a shit shot there as well and Hulk now going to make his way up towards that hill. There's Rulzik missing another important one. He's got to hit those. But you can see that these mediums are going to be quite annoying for Armageddon to deal with because they are always moving up and down that hillside or at least around the place now. And Armageddon actually just r struggling. I think he did get a couple shots early on, but now it's a bit tricky. Lucikel has a decent spot here, actually, but he's got to be careful because he's now going to get pushed onto by Hulknik and Stoik. And, well, this could be dangerous. Hulknik does take a hit, and he's forced to be uh, take at least one shot crossing across the middle. But, yeah, Lucikel has to give up this position, I think. Is Stoic going to go towards him? He'll take one hit happily. He might even have got tracked up there. No repair. Hognik, though, gets just a lanced up on the hill. Tracked in the middle of nowhere. He's ha forced to fire back. Diplomat managed to take down Armageddon, though, as well. And Tornado Rocks are hanging on. They're the kind of team that could salvage something like this, especially Stoic now going to drop. And Hognik in a 1v1. He fires that shot across and hits on towards Vorse. And I think, I think Ding will clean this up, though, Oliver. Yeah, this is game over for sure. I mean, I like that move there from Stoic to put pressure and, and penetrate that object 140, which allowed... Uh, um, the rest of the team to come from behind, finish off the T-125s, and then undoubtedly take down Lucy and positive. All right, it's positive last bear standing. Makar is also there. Positive at least gets that one kill, but he's about to be surrounded and taken out. And our standard for Tornado Rocks is somewhere about here, <laughs> right? They're playing down here. Yeah. If we use them as their own benchmark, as their own ruler, they're playing bad tanks. This is bad. Yeah. This is not good. I'm this not happy just, about this it. This is super aggressive stuff. And then in that last round, you could see they tried to slow up a little bit and you could see there's a clear difference. They came a lot closer, but still like, this is not good. I mean, this, they're not playing well. I think when we were looking against Synergy, you know, Synergy is a worse team than Ding. We can say that for sure. Um, and uh, despite maybe what happened in season one, and we already saw some issues there for Tornado Rocks. Some, a lot of weird rounds. Um, a couple they managed to put together. Of course, they did get the win in the end. But still, that kind of performance hasn't changed. Like, they haven't improved since that day. Which yeah. I thought, you know, would have been a wake-up call for them. Perhaps not. Ding, though, credit to them. They played really well. This is where those T-125s went towards the cap to go for the reset here, all over, at least to try and force Stoik off. They did take their sweet time. But positive, after International actually misses this shot in towards him, which comes a little bit later... Uh, they decide to push up quite happily. That's the signal. That's the go signal, essentially. Stoic pushes off, and then the 125s just move back. I mean, is this is this okay? You're happy with this? It's not really a problem for a Tornado? Not really. I mean, they don't have to worry about too much at this point in time. But, I mean, they have no... They've got... Okay, they've got Bat Chat behind. But I think a lot of the teams, when they're in this position, they just... They have the Object 140 times two, and they just push in with the two Object 140s, the T110s, and they kill Stoic. And then they're safe from Meritorious, and they get control of that middle area. They have Armageddon, they have Luseek, and they have Diodor in the background with a bat chat. So, I mean, that's what a lot of these teams do. Get the overmatches and, and just, um, you know, get a couple of tanks off the map. But here, I mean, Ding have the better positions. They they do take down Dynamo to a fire, basically. So, let's be honest here. It wasn't Tornado Rocks' most lucky round. Two or three tanks got set on fire. But, I mean, you make your own luck at the end of the day. And Tornado Rocks had plenty of opportunities there. Yeah. Plenty of opportunities. It was quite even, even with fires being caught at one point. And look, I've got to give credit to Ding there as well, because we saw it actually on that clip. Uh, the, the STBs actually crossing that middle point of the map, coming around the hill and taking shots at the tanks that set up for Rocks there. It was quite good. That's where FC Dynamo just started to get beaten down there. So good play from Ding. I really, you know, as, as I mean, disconcerting. As disconcerting as it is to see Rocks playing in this sort of manner, Ding are also capitalizing on these mistakes. They're playing good tanks, and this is why they're called the Giant Killers. This is they're why we solid, expect you know? so much from them, even up against these top teams. Yeah, they're playing solid tanks. Like you can't say anything bad about it. It's good. You know, they're they're seeing what Rocks is doing. They're putting pressure on them. They're making them. They're making them make mistakes. Um, and they're just shrugging off all the aggression which Rocks is throwing at them. Um, to me, it doesn't seem like Rocks is really playing a good. A good set of tanks here. So Leopard 1 actually being picked up here for Ding. Mm. Uh, interestingly enough, Rulzik will be playing that one. As, as they are defending, I guess, always nice to have a bit of a sniper in the mix is what I always think when I see that one. Double Conqueror here for Tornado Rock. So kind of a chunky lineup for them, at least those two with the IS-7. And then they can flex around with some medium action with uh, those STBs and Object 140s. Yeah, so a pretty chunky, as you said, lineup. A lot of HP... 
not a lot of flexibility considering they're on the um, attack, but of course they are going to go for the uh, easiest cap to go for, which is cap number one. They can just drive straight down from their spawn point. And uh, I guess with the Conquerors, they could be pretty safe in there. Uh, but, you know, Steig uh, and Ding in general not picking up any artillery. Sometimes we do see Meritorious on that, so a little bit surprising. But immediately, you can see Tornado have been spotted. And I think you'll see Ding with a couple of their tanks immediately try and get control of that mid area and make sure that Tornado Rex can't just drive straight into it as well. Steig able to put one shot towards Lucicurl. And this is a. This is good, actually. I like seeing those uh, those tanks actually take control of the mid. You can see that already this L-shape, a backwards L-shape being formed by Ding, actually going to be able to contest up on these hills as well with the STB sniping from a distance. Tornado Rocks, do they want to push forward on any part of this? Is there a weak point here for Ding? Or they seem to have them on the surround. Yeah, I mean, Tony Rocks, I would have expected them to push forwards and try and get the Conqueror. But look, once again, just like when Ding was on the defense, Ding is surrounding Tornado Rocks, absolutely surrounding them. But I like this from Tornado. They sent Vorsig of the Armageddon to try and stave off Ding's uh, aggression. But again, Tornado Rocks are kind of put in a post box and sent to, uh, I don't know, sent to hell. From Russia with love to hell. Nice. We'll see. As, uh, they're going to be flexing around, maybe think a bit more about that mid-control for themselves here. Get some overmatch towards Meritorious and International. Rakar and Hulknik, I think, are in a position to fire on these guys. And even uh, even Rulzik and that Leopard right up the back there should have line of sight towards this little engagement. So while it looks like Tornado Rocks have all the tanks ready to go, there's probably plenty of ding guns trained at them here. It just really depends. You see the Meritorious sitting down, that little uh, defilade there as well. So it has to be pushed. The Annihilator is going to come around the corner. Shot in towards International. This is a bit better from Tornado Roxy. They've identified maybe some of the weak points here for Ding, but Ding is still able to fire back pretty well. And you can see the arm again getting completely chunked down. He got set on fire again. That's rough. Oh, that's so <laughs> rough. Burn a life. <laughs> Barbecue right now. And, uh, well, Ding are actually getting pretty well damaged. I mean, there's not that much support for International and Meritorious. Yeah, I mean, Diodor, I mean, look, they're going low, these STBs. They are going quite low. Diodor dropping down. Meritorious is a one-shot, but has a shell to use. We'd love to put that one in the direction of Annihilator. And there's uh, Rulzik, sorry, in that Leopard right at the back actually picks up a kill there. So that's great positioning for that little sniper. International, uh... Is actually pushing through there for not really sure what reason. We still have the 5v5 here, so it's not all bad for Ding Ding, but Tornado Rock's definitely making this one a much closer affair. But at the end of the day, they have to either go for some sort of push or for the cap here. And the FC Dynamo is getting bested right now as Rakara is more than happy to push forward and take some shots here. I'm going to miss that one there as well, though. I like Rulzik on this Leopard. I think, you know, there's a time and a place for that tank. I think it definitely has some very defined weaknesses, but when it can sit back and just try and do damage, I think it's very, very potent. Yeah, decent camo, oh, here we decent go. camo value, a lot of uh, a lot of good damage and super accuracy. And here comes Diplomat. He might not be so uh, diplomatic in this, but two versus two, SDB two shot, SE Dynamo two shot, and Dynamo remember can't really peak that much without taking damage from a car. This is going to hurt. Unless Tornado Rocks can turn their heads towards Diplomat, they're going to be up the creek without a paddle. See, uh, uh, Annihilator there is, uh, well, he's been lit as well. So Mercar does take down Lucikel. Diplomat able to come across the top of the hill and sort of choose his targets there. The Annihilator probably will be his first and he somehow bounced that shot. Good turn, at least from uh, rocks towards him now. Diplomat not actually giving Dynamo the respect he possibly deserves in this case, but look at that. All you need is a fully souped up bat chat to come into the mix and actually put some good damage down. And now Tornado Rocks, they're without a hope and now without a chance and Ding are going to take it to match point and Tornado Rocks have not won a round. No, and they, this was definitely the closest round so far. Um, you know, Muravanka definitely lends itself to, a bit, to be a little bit more close when you have some decent players. But again, pretty, <laughs> pretty standard stuff from Ding. And I like that. I like the kind of um, steady headness of Diplomat in the last engagement with the bat chat, because uh, you know when you play the bat chat, if you go too aggressive, you often find yourself with uh, no HP, nothing left of yourself. You're getting absolutely destroyed. You've only got 1.8k and you're just, you know, paper armor. So I like that he just, he kept himself cool, didn't go all the way in, don't, didn't get himself taken down, didn't get rammed. So that was good play from Diplomat. Open the door um, for Ding to win their, their fourth round. I think what Ding needed from Diplomat there as well was him to get a full clip off. He was just to kill the STB and then... You know, that was that was game over. Yeah, the Because then Stoik could uh, could peek there in the RU two five one. The other all the turrets are towards diplomat. Yep. Stoik could get the damage in there and uh, yeah, game over. He did he did a solid amount of uh, damage, two point one K. 
which is all good in tier 8. So this is that Diplomat push there as well. You know, like, like, to be fair, good head turn for Tornado Rocks towards Diplomat, but no water loaders there as well. So, you know, Dynamo just trying to belt away at him. Diplomat there had two shells, one towards the Conqueror positive. He's got a hard head anyway. He still lands one of them. So he used a full clip. He's still alive. I mean, he can always reload. I mean, FC Dynamo found himself on his own at the end. There's something to be said for having like that pocket bat chat just sitting back yeah. because they're the best tanks to flank with. They're so damn good when people aren't like, seeing them coming. Terrible in, in the front line. You just don't use them like that unless it's a light brawl or something like that. But mm -hmm. that turned the, uh, turned the table. I mean, putting out more than 2k damage over the space of his clip, you're laughing. Yeah, this is, this is crazy stuff. I mean, if we just look at the whole situation we have here, we have a Tornado Rocks which is not playing like Tornado Rocks plays. I mean, let's be honest here. This is not tactical game at all. This is players pushing in, being aggressive. This is super simple one-dimensional stuff on every single map we've yep. seen. Ghost Town and Muravanka. You know, like, this is nothing. I mean, we're not even getting the individual play of, of, of uh, Tornado Rocks. We're not getting that, you know, that fantastic spark we often see. So this is just, you know, this is just not Tornado Rocks. Well, Ruhmberg is the next map here. If they, lose on attack, if they lose on defense, like, come on. My point exactly. <laughs> Rocks, uh, they're on defense first, I think? Uh, Are they attacking? Yeah, they're I think so, they're attacking. <laughs> so, Tornado Rocks have to attack on Ruinberg to to stay in the game. This yeah. could be a 5-0, Oliver. Yeah, this could be a 5-0. I think it probably will be. Wow. Looking at every single round. Did you hear that, Melly? 5-0, probably. Tornado Rocks against That's Ding. That's crazy. Stop jinxing it. Yeah, I'll eat I'd be really Jinx happy for Ding. <laughs> that would be insane. A 5-0 against I mean, they've Tornado. Already got, they've already got one. I mean, let's be honest here. If Kaza crew play without Elian next week, yeah. it's still going to win 5-0, you know? So, yeah. like, that's, so. that's, 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 you know, there's no worry here for e any teams against Tornado, I guess. But, I mean, the, the voting was... Uh, how did the voting come down? Surely it was in Tornado Rocks' favour, at least in some way. I know Ding have fans. Uh, I know they like to stream a lot as well, and they're, they're obviously good fun to watch. But what was the voting standing at? Where were people putting their uh, bids? Well, um, at the beginning it was straight over 80% and almost 90 even, but after a while it dropped down to around 75 if I'm not mistaken, and now it's almost 70. Yeah. So there you go, like uh, straight 80 to start with, and even after round after round, Ding were winning. Uh, I mean, it's 3 0 on the stream right now with the delay, exactly. and that's what people are still voting for. So, the chat I don't is know. going crazy. It's, it's actually like, going to be Ding on, <laughs> Ding on the attack. Ding on the attack? Yeah. Okay. That makes m more sense, I guess. Yes. Yeah, it's not a tiebreaker map, so that's just the way it goes. All right, so Ding have to attack here. Fair enough. I mean, if they don't win it, then that's fine. I mean, it's they the best situation they can get. You know, they have the they have a map where the next two rounds, they're four rounds ahead, they can easily win on. Yeah, they have a map where the probability of them getting at least one round is quite high. Yeah. Uh, tank picks are going to be crucial in this one. We've seen uh, some interesting ones in recent times. A mouse being picked up as well. Saw it twice. Once, not so great. The, the second time, I think this, we saw the mouse, it did huge amounts of work there. I think from Synergy, actually. Soaked up a lot of damage and uh, bounced about uh, 3k as well. So very, very important, I think. And it was, an act, it was a defensive side win, to be fair, like we often do see on this map. But I, I like the use of yeah, that well, one. Well. We did also see one where there was a mouse and an E100 going together towards the north side as well. Didn't which was a strong CMO. New, yeah. yeah. Well, they tried to block a 3090 actually inside a cap. There's an fe 215 be a mouse and a E100. <laughs> it was one of the worst tactics I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> but it was very badly executed. I think it could have worked, possibly. Well, like we said, Meritorious and the rest of the crew from Ding, <coughs> excuse me, are going to be on the attacking side. There's your picks. It's a Leopard here for rocks, actually, on the defense. So maybe uh, the prepared strat, or maybe they saw what uh, Rulzik was able to do with it in that last map. Doubt it. Doubt it, too. These are, these are all predetermined picks. So they all pick them before the match. There's no oh, changing. Oh, they send them in, yeah. Yeah, no, there's no changing. It's different in the RU League. Two, two tanks can be changed out. Different rules in every region, GG. Yeah, that's, that's kind of weird. Oh, well, that's fine. Each to their own. Well, at least uh, they can have more than two types of a tank, I suppose. So, bonus. Uh, 62A for Diplomat. Uh, I like seeing that one being uh, brought into the mix here. And on this screen is Stoic, who has... Uh, I, I like this role. I enjoy this tier 8 light role. Uh, the things that you can do with an RU251 is uh, really quite cool, uh, especially when you're not a, a main object of focus by the enemy team. So... We'll see Stoig now head up into that corner as well, maybe to deny that from Vorsik. Now, he will die if he tries to 1v1 Vorsik, obviously, but at least Stoig can spot him early on. It'll be hard to hit, though, but Vorsik has to be dealt with. He cannot be left here. And you can see he takes firing at him now because they know how important it is to deal with that 140. Stoig is probably going to give up his life purely because he was there to spot 
uh, against Vorsen. Mm. The diplomat as well knows that uh, they, they've got to get rid of... This is such a disgusting position to try and deal with when you're trying to cap. It's true. I mean, Vorsic has to go down. Um, the zero line is, is so important on this map. Possibly the most important part of the whole map we've seen, especially in 768, when with the T-54 lightweights... Or with, with, it was pretty easy with the T-54 lightweights and the Namex 1390 to, to take um, K-0. But with these slightly slower tanks, the Object 140s, um, at least in t terms of horsepower per ton ratio, you're not going to get there before the other team does. So it definitely comes into the equation. But, yeah, I mean, pretty slow start from Ding. They have that southern side completely under control. Nothing up north, even though I think probably with that E50 up north, it would be a pretty easy job to take it down and yeah. then also cap. So maybe they will decide to rotate that. Well, usually it's an IS-7 there or something even bigger, like a mouse. So... I think Ding have to go there. I think they just literally have no hope uh, trying to go for the cap point number two. But the thing is, surely after a while, Tornado Rocks are not dumb. They, they do some dumb stuff, but they're not stupid. I think they're going to know uh, after after long exactly what is going to be happening. If they don't see anyone from Ding for a while, they'll know that they're rotating up towards the north side and doing something like that. So we'll see. We will see. Yeah. On your screen is FC Dynamo up in the corner as well. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of a slow movement towards the north. <clears throat> and bear in mind is that rocks have the 50 bees as well that can uh, move to support and the leopard which is quite sprightly as well that can get uh, up towards that north side and actually add their support there is really i mean object one forty dynamo though he's receiving a bit from mccar there nice little shots through the building all right actually just in the little window mccar's actually a bit out of pick towards him so that's not too shabby at all in fact taking a reasonable amount of damage in the process and this is international. He'll be the man that wants to open up things in this top side by pushing towards that northern house. Lucy Kell is going to be there. And you can already see uh, the Annihilator actually towards the back side of that city. Might even run to try and reinforce the northern side. Or at least Tornado Rocks are ready to fire on any tanks that cross. So Lucy Kell will spot international. If international gets tracked, he's going to get wrecked. It's going to be game over for him straight away. He's already spotted, so that's not ideal. Shot, shot, two shots already. Three, that one bounced. There's none. He's tracked. He's probably dead. He's dead. And that's why you don't push that with one freaking tank. Yeah, I mean, Lucy was in a good position there to spot. And international, very questionable driving. I mean, he probably should have gone around to the left side as far as possible. But it's a gamble, like, you know, when you're pushing up north, it's always a gamble. Sometimes you get across with a few hundred HP and you can do good work. Sometimes you don't. And, um, yeah, I mean, again, I think one tank is probably pretty stupid because the likelihood that you're going to get killed is, is reduced by two when you are um, you know have two tanks going up north. So that was pretty bad. Um, but, yeah, I mean, ding. Now 3,000 hit points behind more centric than they were previously. They got the uh, AMX 50Bs, those heavier tanks up north, um, in the middle even, sorry. And uh, this probably they're going to end up pushing in pretty soon, I think. Just wanting to get on the defense. Well, 3K up on uh, for Tornado, Tornado Roxy. Much slower map from them. And it's Vorsen, man. Seriously, such a problem. That's why defense on this map is so much easier. If you can't use the north... Ding didn't have a great composition to rush up north as well. I mean, they probably wanted at least, or at least to put the 140s with the bat chat. Like, have some more tanks there. But they're always going to have to sacrifice something to try and get rid of loose kills. So, I mean, hard to win that, really. I, I, yeah, tough. Tough! But five minutes and 23 seconds left. Meritorious and Hulknik still uh, just trying to watch towards that middle road, hoping to try and get some value here at this stage for some tank for a rock that's going to be out of position. But uh, most teams know how to win out pretty hard on this map, I think. And... I think we'll see that uh, it be very, very difficult for Ding to really make the Ooh, difference here. Died or just... What the hell is he doing? He's uh, dying. He's dead. Surely. Well, he's still alive, oh, but... Just about survived I don't that understand one. that peak at all. No, he just peaks, gets spotted there by Diplomat, I believe, and just gets basically killed. Oh, Diplomat, no, is also a one-shot. He uh, decides to peak. Positive takes him down. I think he was perma-tracked there. So, yeah, I mean, they, they I thought they would be in the game, but then uh, died or... Uh, then, uh, Ding decides to peak one tank, and now they're two tier ten tanks down. Not good. Uh, Tornado Rocks will hold here as well. They don't really have to push up at all. Much slower game to what we're used to seeing uh, by comparison. It does look like at least Ding are trying to go for something in the north side as well. So maybe move those 50 Bs up in some fashion uh, to get them involved towards Lucy Kell. He was spotted actually as well. I think Hulk he Nick shot. Yeah, I don't know why he fired. I guess he was maybe a little bit nervous off about all the tanks that were coming towards him. But he backs up a little bit, only only a little bit, because he knows he's got the protection of the buildings there. 
Hulknik was the man firing that shot. Getting some damage on the Lucifer, what most of these guys are. So, some good free damage for Ding. I mean, we saw what they managed to do to Diodor before as well. So, it's not lost for them here, but with only four minutes left, it's going to take them a little while to really get things set up properly. And you can see that now, I mean, this, this entire uh, eastern side of the map has gone over to Tornado Rocks. They have control of that as well. It's going to be that much harder to get back in. Yeah, this is interesting, actually. Ding is not going for that northern side. I mean, typically... A lot of teams just on the attack, at this late stage at least, just go for the northern side, go for a push, put the Object 140s in the cap and just try and cap it out as quickly as possible. But actually they've rotated and might just catch out Tornay Rocks who are sitting more towards the middle, but they will need Murakar to go forwards in the Object 140 to try and get some spots. And that he will do. He's not going to be uh, taking any damage quite yet. The 50 Bs now are being responded onto there as they were lit. Makar is also around the corner and Hulkning just getting decimated. A lot of guns pointed in his direction, but he's going to be able to oh, bear the brunt of most of that damage, actually. Meritorious is on reload. Now he's taking a shot as well, enough to force him right away from that one. And the 50 Bs, honestly, have been able to unload fairly well, but the damage also has been coming back well from Tornado Rocks. They've responded to that. And uh, it's going to be very, very hard for Ding now to come back. I think they've been chunked down quite heavily. In all fairness, it's a 6v5, but mm. it's uh, yeah, 3k hit points between them. You can just see with positive, uh, still so healthy. But like you said, in this format, 768, those health point totals can turn around very, very quickly. Yeah, especially with the 50Bs. I mean, they just they just take 1,000 hit points off you within 5 seconds, 6 seconds. So it could be very bad. SC Dynamo looks like he wants to peek against Murakar, but they're on similar HP. So And of course, Murakar on the defensive here. We'll be able to get the first shot, probably perma-track him and take him down. So obviously SD Dynamo can't go forwards. But Stoik and Mary have found a way onto the back of Dynamo. But Vorsik as well up north is uh, is in a defensive position. Stoik might go down. Yes, he does, of course. The Annihilator with that laser gun takes him out. And with him, surely the last hope for Ding. Yeah, I mean, the Leopard 1 always reminds me a bit of a, a surgeon scalpel. It's very, very precise. And as like you said, uh, just an amazing sniper. Incredibly accurate. So only three tanks left here for Ding. They've, have, they've given a good shot at it, to be honest. They haven't really thrown themselves away. They haven't really jumped into the fire here at all. But Tornado Rocks have just managed to put up a very, very solid defense here. And they had sure as hell better hope they have a good attack. Because if not, they're still going to lose. Yeah, for me, Ding should be able to defend this one and win it out. I mean, the only way I see really Tornado were winning this, just, just based on their performance, is just going for something YOLO and catching Ding completely off surprise, off guard. And maybe that wouldn't even work, because let's be honest here, it's been a very, very, very aggressive Tornado Rock, so Ding probably would be expecting something like that. And if you count, I mean, we got three now, three one-shot tanks, two, because one just died, Lucique. So that's a, that's a pretty close attacking round, I have yep. to say. Yeah, I mean, only like it's about 4k hit points for Rox here in the end. And like, like you said, Vorsum was still quite healthy, but Ding, yeah, it's super hard. Ruinberg is really, really hard for attacking teams to work. And the times that we've seen attacking rounds work, I think most of them are defending mistakes, big defending mistakes. I think we've seen one really good attacking round in the past. Uh, uh, the team actually eludes me now, but they, they played it well. They played it very, very well, but also it wasn't. Uh, Again, still wasn't a great lineup by the defensive side here. So, you know, take away the pinch of salt, of course, uh, you know, the, the fact that we are seeing these teams fall over on the attacking side of Ruhlberg. It's an insanely hard map to play in. Um, like we said, it, whether it will stay in the pool or not in the long term remains to be seen. We'll, we'll obviously be keeping an eye on how it does sort of perform. But this was where things were still on the balance for Ding. This is where they still had a shot to uh, make the difference. Yeah, I think there's two things that happened. Obviously, the most important one is that they lost their bat chat early on, international. I think if he hadn't gone down and they made more of a concerted push, it probably would have been a win there for Ding. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it's a gamble, as I said. The bat chat just falling to a perma track is probably going to happen at some point in time. And then there were some bad peaks there from Ding. Uh, they lost uh, another Object 140 a little bit later on. So, But by that time, it was pretty much game over, let's be honest here. But we're moving now on to the defense side of Ruhrberg. Now, this is a side which Ding has so far been faultless this season. We've had some interesting tactics. We've had Meritorious using GVP, UV Tiger, yep. a That's couple of good, times. Actually. And it's worked well against at least aggressive tactics. Yeah, it definitely catches tanks pushing across over on that uh, eastern side of the map. So it's a possibility here. I don't know if he'll go for that one again. Uh, Doesn't it's seem so. Super, it's super interesting to see that one come the, in. He hasn't joined the team yet, so. But uh, we might actually see the return of the Object 263 here as well, that Russian tank destroyer, which, as you said, probably has the best DPM in the game. Yeah. In the game. Yeah. In the game. In the it's game. It's insane. 590 damage just in the game. Absolutely wrecks you, you know, be careful. Great penetration, APCR, like eight and a half seconds reload. 
you can't argue with it, really. Yeah. So we'll see that one come into the mix here as well. And that has been seen before for defensive <coughs> teams that are favoured to go towards the, the east side village, sit up amongst those buildings and just take shots here. For uh, Tornado Rocks, doesn't seem like anything overly notable for them at this stage. Meritorious is going to be playing uh, the 2 on 5 b as well here. So looks like a solid lineup, I have to say. Um, I would be, I'd be very, very surprised if Tornado win this one. And the only reason why I say that is because... To win an attacking round of Ruhlberg takes some imagination. It takes some very some very nice tactics or getting quite lucky if the defensive team makes a big mistake. Yeah. Ding, haven't really seemed like this team at all tonight. I mean, you, you don't be 4-1 up uh, by making a lot of mistakes. Whereas Tornado Rocks haven't been imaginative at all. They haven't really gone with anything crazily tactical. They got themselves a defensive round on, on Ruhlberg. Brilliant. Yeah, I would say, I mean, at this point in time, of course, there's that last round jitters here from Ding. But, I mean, let's be honest, in that last attacking round we just saw from them, it wasn't jittery at all. Like, they tried to play it through. They kept the pressure on throughout the match. They're playing good individually. There were some errors there for sure, but, like, it was a solid round. So they didn't throw it away at all. So I think that, that pressure on the attacking side will translate into a better result here on the defensive side. And if they lose it, you know, it's on them. It's their fault. And, uh, yeah, sure, I mean, Tony Rocks can come back in this match, but they've already lost a point. That's the second point this season, or it's two points potentially. Yeah. Um, and, you know, teams like Walmart's on Tanks and Kazza Crew had that nightmare from season one where they wanted to get in towards that playoffs automatically. Yeah. We'll be gunning for those, to those, those top two spots, which will undoubtedly, you know, get you that auto qualifier, which Tornay Rocks would desperately want as well, considering they had some nightmares in season one. So that's what, you know, the end game is for these kind of teams. So losing one, two, three points in tiebreakers is, uh, you know, a good way to end at third, fourth, fifth, and sixth in the in the table. Yeah, I mean, it's not great. I mean, when you've already got teams that are putting up these big results and getting a Kazna crew, for example, coming up with four clean wins, and then you, uh, you know, who want to be challenging that, even if you beat Kazna crew later on in the season, numerically, you probably even haven't amassed as much points as they have. So, brilliant, good on you. You beat Kazna crew, but, like, what have you done against teams like Ding? What have you done against teams like Synergy or exactly. whatever? You know what I mean? Yeah. You need to uh, go through the season in a consistent fashion. You can't just get big, flashy wins against some teams. We have seen the 1184 object 263 combination here before. It's very, very powerful. Uh, and Ding looked to start off fairly strong on this defensive side after a very, very... Very slow first map, uh, first round on this one. Four to one, it's still match point, guys. And Ding have plenty of those ones up their sleeve after an impressive showing on those first two. Have definitely taken Tornado Rocks by surprise. We're going to have to see something special here from the Russians. Yeah, and I think for Ding, they don't really have to provide us anything special. They need to stay solid, need to uh, stay calm, and uh, they just need to just sit back, relax, and just let Tornado Rocks come at them because that's exactly what they're doing pushing straight through the middle of the map with all their medium tanks. Already some damage going towards Diodor. And it seemed like uh, Ding was ready and waiting for this because they sent uh, Merry and Di yeah. Diplomat in those two fe 215 piece forwards. Good positioning for those guys. I like that a lot. Uh, close enough to catch the push across. Positive just took a massive hit there as well. Uh, as Dinor did take a little bit of damage here. So, I mean, not bad for Ding. Not bad. Uh, Stoic now will be caught, though. He's got a huge overmatch to deal with, and there's not really anyone to fire uh, into this for him. But he's actually done a bit of damage to his Dinor as well. He's made him pay for getting that victory there. But now, now our Tornado Rocks have control of the capture point and these houses. So, Ding have to come forward into this one and have to sort of win the firefight. But you see that Merry and Diplomat might be held in place by Armageddon here. Or maybe Tornado Rocks can descend on towards those guys and try and get that overmatch. But it'd be dangerous, of course, with the, with the tank destroyers waiting. But they're going to go for it anyway, Oliver. They're just going to go straight across. Uh, FC Dynamo has to be careful because the, RU, uh, two, the 263 is just there and behind. But they're still going oh for it. Oh, my God. What? Look at those traces going into the side of Tornado Rocks. They just want to put themselves on the barbie with the shrimp. This is ridiculous. Is to, Diplomat's just going to get blown up. He's, he is a one-shot. But look at Tornado Rocks. Look how they've given themselves up, offered themselves as targets pushing across. They've at least been able to get Diplomat off the map. And they're actually holding on in terms of the trades here. They've got more tanks to work with. But damage, of course, uh, is going to be hurting coming out from Ding. What's going on here? Tornado might actually be able to turn this around. Those last few seconds have been good for them. International and Rakar have managed to pick up a couple of those Tornado Rocks tanks. And here's Hulknik in the 50B. And also you got Positive a one-shot, but he's actually going to come off reload. And Hulknik can't make all the shells, otherwise Positive will be able to find Rulzek. So this is back and forward stuff, but Tornado is somehow still alive. That's right. They're pushing towards Rakar here as well. And they do have the overmatch on him. Rulzek trying to deal with Positive, or maybe even Vorsen. He's taking a big hit. This one could go down to the wire here. Is Ding going to be short on tanks? They're not going to have too many of them here. Rakar falls 
that makes it two. Hognik's on reload, and oh my lord, Rusik, the only one who can fire, he's going to be focused down by these guys pushing forward. Unbelievable. I mean, the Object 263 has no real armor to speak of, oh and my God. Ding has just thrown this one to the wind and given this game away <sighs> because Hognik is the only one remaining. How does this happen? <laughs> How does this happen? What happened? Oliver, help! You know the analysis guy. <laughs> what happened? What the heck? They just, uh, I mean, the two FE215Bs went forwards. Okay, good for initial damage, but then there was no real push in there from Ding. I mean, they kept the, their 263 back. They let Stroy get taken down. He wasn't being fast or dynamic at all with his 26, uh, uh, his uh, MX3090. He should right. have been straight down into K0, yep. shooting across. Good side shots. He could have stayed invisible. He could have been in real pain there for. Tornado Rocks. And yeah, I mean, here, Hulnik's not taking down positive when he obviously should have done. That would have been great. Rulzik does really nothing in this game, and this is just terrible from them. I mean, Rulzik did good damage at 3.2k, but Armageddon as well. Armageddon, FC Dynamo, especially Armageddon with that uh, E50 in the middle, just shooting cross, doing so much damage. And Murkar, two versus one here against two Object 140 is terrible. Ding had us, uh, well, they were inches away from victory there as well. And if there's any sort of map you expect or a side that you expect a team to get a win on, it's Ruenberg defense. That golden opportunity has gone begging now. And we do have one more map left before the tiebreaker. It's going to be Mines. Now, this could well go all the way. I mean, it's just the one map, and the Tornado Rocks are really solid on this one, that they're going to make Ding pay for squandering rounds that they maybe should have won. I didn't really even think we'd get to this point, but here we are. Four to two. Ding still have match point. They had four match points. They've lost two of those now, and they still need to get around here on mines. Tornado Rocks looks like they have an aptitude for making snap decisions and actually making them work for them. Yep. I mean, I, I was almost being uh, rhetorical by saying, are they going to go for this push towards these two one five bigs? Because, um, I mean, there was so, much, so many tech destroys, of course, for Ding to be watching them. I'm impressed, I really am, because I was the way I casted it, if you probably heard it, was like, they're about to get wrecked, and then all of a sudden, the 215Bs are dead, I'm like, wow, okay, they actually made that work, but not committing fully across that road as well, maybe not offering too much of a target for themselves, but also having a presence on the far eastern side of the map, being able to harass the 263. Nice work, really. Can't, uh, I have to say that's a bit better from Tornado Rocks. First couple of rounds were very, very slapdash, but this has been uh, much better. better. Uh, quick to react, good individual play prioritizing mistakes from the other team. Um, but I say, you know, Ding, again, not getting in the right positions, giving tanks away. Yep. People are playing segmented, and uh, yeah, it fell apart very quickly for them. So I think they'll be more kicking themselves than uh, Tornado Rocks will be happy with that round. Yep. But they are now two rounds ahead after Ruinberg, which is not good stuff. We're moving on to Mines, which is a high skill map. It, it favors teams which make quick decisions and individual skill as well. So this could be awkward for Ding if this does go two rounds as well to, to Tornado. Well, after that last map, we really wouldn't rule anything out, Oliver. Let's jump into Mines and see exactly if Ding can actually finish things off or would Tornado Rocks take it to the tiebreaker? Tornado Rocks have to attack here. Now, will we see uh, similar scenes as we did last night from that, this defensive push up towards the hill? I think we might. They're going to send the batch out in the RU251 up. And it looks like Tornado Rocks are just set up to try and fire towards them. Two shots going in, three, four, maybe, maybe just a three actually and that's not too bad they have that heal control now but Diodor and Vorsen keep an eye on those two tanks they're about to put out a world of hurt there's so much damage from those uh, AMX 50Bs but Diplomat's now off reload that's it Diodor going down very very low Diplomat ready to fight now as well Vorsen going to be pushing across the face of him but International and Meritorious are taking a heck of a lot of damage Vorsen could probably get bursted down here that was Diplomat's last shot Stoic should be able to finish that 50B off and he does but there's Lucicurl coming forward in the Annihilator as well and Ding getting hammered now being forced back FC Diodor I'm on Lucicwell pushing forward. Positive goes down. Rakar focuses him correctly, but now he will also drop. Tornado Rocks down to three, though. Ding still keeping themselves in this one. It's Hognik, the warrior. He's getting around it, and that Batchat's almost off reload. Diplomat going to be pushing off the hill, looking for these two here, as Defsy Dynamo forced to give up ground. Lucicwell can't double up on towards Hognik because he's got Stoic to worry about, and Diplomat blocking shots now until he's off reload. He even bounced that one as well. The luck is in Ding's favor right now, and there come the shots. 2v2 though, gonna be close there, Stoic got blown up pretty quickly, but bear in mind, the Armageddon's been in artillery this whole time, and what his team has done hasn't really allowed him to do as much damage as he would the have misses, liked. The misses from Diplomat hitting the, the, the track of Lucic. Still will drop him down, and Armageddon, 
Okay, here's the thing, right? If, if you want to play that Arnie from the north side, it makes sense. But if you if your team's going to push over and go into a massive fight and no one's going to be static, no one's going to be rolling back and forth or staying still, then poor Armageddon really doesn't have much to shoot at. He's just going to try and take his chances and land as many lucky shots as he possibly can. Now, he has to await his fate. Tornado Rocks, they've lost this. They had opportunities, a plenty. But that bat shot for Diplomat, making the difference, getting up on the hill, coming off reload, letting a clip go, reloading, letting another clip go, and ding. I would say strike make the biggest difference. Like, you know, it's such a pain the to have you. the RU251 up on the hill. Yeah. You know, just having to aim at him and worry about him when he can just sit in the background. He doesn't need to get involved with these shots. And uh, Diplomat will fall in the next volley and unbelievable. 5-3, 5-2 result to Ding. Ding have done it. On Mines, we said maybe this will be the comeback here for Tornado Rocks. There's possibility. Um, but like you said as well, I love to see the defensive side push a bat chat and are you onto the hill. And you're right. As much as Diplomat was really, really good with the damage he was able to put yeah, out. He definitely was a damage dealer there. Yeah, but I mean, normally Tornado Rocks could have ignored him knowing he was off reload. Or on reload, should I say. But Stoik was there constantly putting damage back. When you've got... And this is why we used to see the combination as well. There always was a... A sweet spot between IS-3s and 5100s in the old format because yeah. there's consistent damage coming in every eight to nine seconds and then those autoloaders coming off reload. Talk us through this. Well, this is just super aggressive from Tornado Rocks. I mean, the, the, obviously the biggest kill here and the one that really gave Ding was the, uh, the win was Diador, just pushing straight across and giving his side a way to strike and Diplomat who just came off reload. So they lost the 50B for basically nothing and they lost the second one there to those two as well. And that's such a big, big kill. 3,300 damage with four kills from Diplomat. And then we get into the later game. You can see Tornado Rocks playing well, some individual ability here. But then you have the situation where you've got a non-combat tank for Tornado Rocks who's out of the game. And you have two combat tanks, uh, three combat tanks for um, Ding who are in the game, who are in the firefight, who are doing the damage. So that's when you can see where Stoik gives his team that advantage and does do 1.7K. So. You're like, okay, great. So maybe if you're playing a slower match, the artillery makes a difference, yep. gets you the win. But when you're in those clutch situations, having that extra tier eight there makes a massive difference. And not even if it does any damage, just being a thorn on the side and someone they have to think about. Yeah, I mean, he, he it's a tank on the field. And also the difference between, let's say, taking a tier eight uh, light tank like the RU251 yeah. and an artillery like the M40, M43 is that the RU251 can be deliberate. He can fire at any tank that his team is telling him to, so he can help focus tanks down. Mm -hmm. An artillery player has to be opportunistic. Mm -hmm. They have to go for the shots that are available. It's not all shots are available for an artillery, especially when there's a rocks in the middle of the map and everyone was moving like crazy, so you just get what you can. So yep. Armageddon did about 1,600 damage, so you know, not too bad at all, and it was Good. comparable to what Stoic did, but he couldn't join his team's efforts in focusing fire. He just had to hope that he was hitting a tank doing some damage, but he couldn't get killing blows he couldn't finish them off mm. he just got some damage and sprinkled it over the top or stoic could say well right you guys want to go for him let's go i'm going to add my damage on towards that pile and just be another body that needs to be taken care of at some point whereas armageddon when his team is dead what then he's useless yeah. whereas if you have an ru251 on a dead team i mean if it's a 1v1 or something you can still do so much with that tank why did tornado rocks not play more to the start of having armageddon there as artillery like couldn't should they have slowed it down a bit with, with that on this side, or were they too concerned about the bat chat and 251 on the hill? Well, they didn't necessarily have to be concerned. I mean, with those 50Bs, that says to me straight away, and you know, Tornado loves those 50Bs, that they're going to go forwards, they're going to be aggressive, they're going to go for that damage. But, um, I mean, okay, like if, if, Tornado, if Armageddon can find a one-shot or something or do some real big damage there, fair enough. But um, I think if you're going to play a slower, a slower game, that's good for artillery. If you keep your 50Bs back, work back, you have a T110 or an IS-7 there, you're playing towards that back line, fair enough. But that's not Tornado Rocks' plan. And um, again, I think Diodor being aggressive there with the 50B just getting crunched down, um, that was really what lost them in the game. Just those initial firefights definitely didn't go their way. I mean, it was a three versus three situation, but at the end of the day, with that combat tank situation, with also, I mean, um, Ding being ahead in terms of hit points, like that was that's it's a spreadsheet game at that point, and you're gonna always gonna lose in terms of that. So I mean, altogether, Tony Rocks just what a nightmare that that match was. Average is being kind about it. Melly, a uh, surprise for all of us here as well, of course. Uh, before we wrap things up, there, I'd love to know yours and of course our friends out there's thoughts on that game because definitely not uh, working as expected, perhaps. Not really. I mean, we were today. I'm taking Alex's our observers. Um, 
predictions for like the main topic of the day and he finally hit the score line sadly <laughs> for the wrong team alex <laughs> maybe right. better luck next time darling and um yeah I, i'm just checking if actually someone got it right yeah we have a couple people guessing the uh, correct score on this match congratulations but i must say oh no there are, there are actually two people like the very first score Gunesh. Congratulations. Really? Nice. Yes. It's, Very nice. Well, it surprises me, to be honest, because who would have thought um, that this match is going that clear in Ding's favor, to be honest? Yeah, it's a weird scoreline. It's a weird scoreline. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No one expected it besides you. Congratulations. And a few others. Those winners will be announced next week. As said, the first two match weeks are already announced regarding a team vote over at facebook.com slash WGLU. Check out the regarding posting from back in match week one and two, which was the very first week of our broadcast. And see in the comment section below the, those postings if you're one of the lucky winners. And if so, please drop us a message via our Facebook page and then you will get your bonus code. Also, thank you for participating that much. It was awesome reading from you guys <laughs> and seeing your predictions and your votes and all. Don't forget to follow our Twitch channel. It's really important so you get a notification as soon as we're going live next week, which is different, but I'll leave that one to you guys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, don't forget to follow our YouTube channel to see the VODs of our past seasons, big events, or also the past match weeks. Thank you very much, Millie. Facebook and Twitter Facebook. and all those. The usual stuff. Yeah, you've even got it on the screen behind you, so everyone can see that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Melly. It's been uh, good to have you along tonight, Oliver. Now, let's just wrap things up, of course. Three games tonight, and, well, what an assortment of score lines we did see. Yeah, I mean, all across the board, we had the good 5-3 at the beginning. Penta got tested kind of mid-match uh, mid in a couple of weird rounds. Three really weird rounds, I have to say, especially that one on Cliff. But they got it done in the end with three points. Kaz, the crew, I mean... Absolute annihilation of out of range. Out of range, we need to rethink their strategy and strategies on Prokhorovka, for instance. And that nightmare, as I said, um, match there for Tornado Rocks is a team that really wants to be the best in the world. Getting 5 2 by Ding is not how you start. No. Very, uh, very average from Tornado Rocks here and hoping to pick things up. Of course, Monday, not Tuesday, Monday night, 7 p.m. CST. We'll be kicking things off here with a blockbuster, Oliver. Cast the crew. Up against Tornado Rocks. I mean, typically I'd be like, yeah, it's going to be one of the best, you know, matches this season. You know, come on, guys, it's going to be sick. But after, like, the last three matches I've seen from Tornado, I mean, I don't I don't see anything but a 5-2 maximum going in favor of Kassler Crew. Like, unless Tornado Rocks really turn up, they're going to get flattened by Kassler Crew with a performance like we saw today. Strong CMO, ding. Strong CMO, I hope they continue their... their up and up form. They seem to be better today than they were in, in the last few matches. And Ding have really started to perform this season. We've been waiting a long time throughout the whole of season one. Finally seem to be in form. Can't wait to see if they can actually make themselves towards an offline finals. Utopia out of range. Another Polish derby. And uh, well, I think for out of range, it's going to be a proving point as uh, to say, okay, we want to be the best team in a uh, Polish team, at least in the WGLU. They have a long way to go, but it would be a good start to uh, take down Utopia, of course, for uh, out of range to prove themselves. That's all we have for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. And of course, next Monday night, we'll be back, of course, with week five of the WGL EU season two for 2015 and 2016. Until then, have a good weekend. And we'll see you then.